Welcome uh, to a very special Wednesday afternoon lecture, the William E. Paul lecture, an annual opportunity to hear from a distinguished scientist working in areas of immunology, which were the incredible contributions of our long-term NIH scientific leader, uh, Bill Paul, who was chief of the NIAID Laboratory of Immunology. It's quite a week we're having here with Nobels being announced this week. I have to just say for one moment how pleased we all were on Monday morning at 5.30 a.m. Uh, to learn that one of our own scientists, Harvey Alter, was amongst those chosen for the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for the work that he did on hepatitis C along with two other colleagues. And we had a wonderful day with Harvey on Monday, of course, physically distanced appropriately, but holding a press conference and some social media activities and reminding ourselves of just what a wonderfully gentle, self-effacing uh, guy who just wanted to do the right thing to help people avoid a terrible illness. And boy, did he ever do that. So congrats to Harvey. And then today, uh, to find out again, very early in the morning, uh, that after some anticipation over the last three or four years, the Nobel Committee did decide it's time uh, for CRISPR-Cas to be recognized, this revolutionary gene editing uh, technology that has changed everything in molecular biology and awarded that prize to two women, which makes this even more over the top wonderful, uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, both highly deserving of this recognition. So yeah, it's nice to have some really good, wonderful things happening in the midst of what is admittedly a tough year. Part of that tough year is that we are gathering uh, virtually for this instead of what previously would have been a gathering in the Missouri Auditorium, but we're making the best of that. And one of the positives is that a lot more people maybe are able uh, to link in and take advantage of the science that we're about to hear uh, from our speaker. Before I get to introduce the speaker though, I do wanna say something about Bill, Paul, because some of the newer arrivals at NIH may not know about this legendary character. He was a shining icon and an international giant in contemporary immunology. He had an enormous impact on science as well as being a trainer of many distinguished leaders who have gone on uh, to become really quite legendary themselves in the field and many of whom are themselves now involved in trying to unravel the immunological mysteries of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I also am happy to say that amongst the folks that are joining us today remotely is Bill's widow, Marilyn, who I've gotten to know over the years. Uh, Marilyn, it's wonderful that you could join this little gathering. I must tell you, I enjoyed looking back at a couple of your memories of Bill while I was preparing to do this introduction. And I found a set of remarks that you put in the Frontiers in Immunology tribute to Bill, which was an entire special issue. Uh, you said, and I'm quoting here, every day that he went to work was a joyful day. Every evening that he worked at home was a joyful evening. At the end of the day, he told me he quit only when he realized he had to read something three times. He took that as a signal he was tired and should stop and have some ice cream, <laughs> well-deserved ice cream. I'm gonna remember that the next time I realize I had to read something three times, because it does happen. Uh, so what a wonderful way uh, for us to reflect uh, on Bill and those of us who knew him, he just radiated uh, that joy uh, in the experience of doing science and learning things about the immune system. And Marilyn, if you're able to unmute and just say a word uh, to the assembled group here, that would be wonderful to hear your voice for a minute. Are you there? Thank you very much for this opportunity and for conducting this lecture, even though it has to be virtual, I'm sure Bill would approve of that decision. And now I have a little sentence that I would like to add. I hope it's not too embarrassing, but um, I have wonderful memories of the time we were living in New York and Bill and I and Ruth and Victor would spend social time and science time together. Those were wonderful years. And then I have another memory that I'd like to share. And that's a memory of Michelle and my son, Matthew, playing basketball at a Gordon conference. And these two teenage boys were having a lot of fun while their parents were doing science. 
and this is a long time ago, way before iPhones and way before iPhones and cameras. So I don't have a photo to share, but I do have that lovely image etched in my own mind. So thank you for the opportunity for letting me share that. And thank you and congratulations to Michelle for honoring Bill this afternoon. Oh, Marilyn, thank you so much for that wonderful reflection. I didn't know about those connections. I'm glad you were able to share them with everybody. Well, I know we are now uh, 550 people are watching and the number is still growing, but it's time for me to introduce the actual presenter, uh, Michelle Nussenzweig of Rockefeller University. Uh, maybe after what we've all been through this year, we could all use a big bowl of ice cream. <laughs> and this will be our intellectual uh, version of that uh, because Michelle, who as a graduate student, uh, was the one who was able to identify that dendritic cells actually present antigen, which was a pretty amazing thing to get started with. And now rising to the challenge uh, of COVID-19, which is what he's gonna talk with us about today, using a combination of biochemistry, molecular biology and genetics, uh, as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and Rockefeller professor, he's broadened his studies of the molecular aspects of innate and adaptive immune responses to include SARS-CoV-2. And in particular, as a pioneer in the field of antibody-based therapies for HIV, he's turned his attention to what might be done in terms of human antibody therapeutics and responses to SARS-CoV-2 a topic that could hardly uh, be more timely. Just this morning, uh, the Lilly Company uh, released uh, information that they uh, feel that they have enough preliminary data uh, about a monoclonal antibody uh, directed against SARS-CoV-2 uh, that they intend to go to FDA and ask for emergency use authorization. This, so this is starting to work and uh, want to hear from Michelle all of the ins and outs of how we take this kind of science and bring it forward uh, to this global pandemic. So without further ado, uh, let me ask you virtually uh, to welcome our speaker uh, for the William Paul Lecture, whose title as Human Antibody Responses to SARS-CoV-2, Dr. Nussenzweig. Okay, well, um, thank you, Francis. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. It's really, um, it's such an honor to do this. Um, as Marilyn mentioned, um, my parents and Bill uh, and Marilyn um, were close and at the time that uh, they were all working uh, at NYU with Baruch Ben Asraf and, and um, I got to meet Bill at that time. Um, and then eventually when I uh, became a scientist, uh, Bill was incredibly supportive. Um, in, in, in so many ways and, and I got to interact with him. Uh, at NIH, at the Howard Hughes, and at a whole bunch of meetings where um, Bill would occasionally take me to dinner with Marilyn. So it's, it's really a great honor to do this uh, for Bill. Now, what I, I, I'm going to talk about today um, are first a little bit of immunology, uh, which is relevant to understanding how people respond to the coronavirus. Um, something about how we came to work on the coronavirus uh, and then uh, the corona experiments. This first slide um, just shows you that what I'm going to talk about today is not simply the work of one laboratory, but is the work of several different laboratories and supported entirely um, in, 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 or in very, very large part by the NIH. And I should say that um, that support uh, comes from the very top, <clears throat> but um, many, many colleagues at NIH. And I wanna give a special shout out uh, to Jean Patterson and Kui Dang, um, who have been involved in um, designing and helping to execute uh, some of the experiments, the animal experiments that I'm gonna talk about at the end of the talk. All right, so with that, um, Let's get started. Um, so first thing is what my lab has been interested in for a long time uh, is this problem that um, Herman Eisen uh, pointed out or this observation that Herman Eisen pointed out and Benasraf actually um, 
Bill's mentor, uh, also had something to do with this discovery. And that is that antibody affinity increases with time shortly after uh, an immunization. And this is a logarithmic increase um, in the affinity of antibodies. We've learned a lot about how this happens. It's illustrated in part on this slide. Uh, so the immune system is composed of cells. Each cell has a, a unique receptor with a specificity. And when uh, the immune system is challenged by uh, a virus or some pathogen, uh, cells that have the correct receptors are expanded. Now what happens in the B cell compartment, and this is quite different from what happens with T cells, is that they don't just undergo a, a, a clonal expansion, they also diversify their genes, their antibody genes during clonal expansion. This is really a strange thing, and they do it by mutation, somatic mutation. So this enzyme AID that was discovered by Tosco Hanjo and his colleagues and Durandi in France at about the same time, goes into the genome and makes small modifications, point mutations in antibody genes. And instead of a monomorphic clonal expansion, what you get is a whole diverse group of uh, lymphocytes that differ from each other by these small mutations in the antibody gene. And then there is selection, selection for cells that are producing high affinity antibodies. This is essentially how you get that affinity maturation discovered by Eisen. The way this happens is a cytosine deamination, which causes a mismatch in DNA, and that mismatch is then processed to create somatic mutations. You can do gene conversion, class switch recombination, and it is dangerous because it can cause chromosome translocation or mutations that are cancer producing. And in fact, most of the lymphomas in humans come as byproducts of this reaction. Now, the mutations are important, and they are, this, this is something that was argued about for a long time. Does it really matter that there are mutations in antibody genes, but in fact, they're critical? And that's shown here in these examples from HIV. These are four different HIV antibodies, and you can see that their SPR traces, they, they have an affinity for the antigen. But if you take away the mutations, that goes away. And more importantly, these antibodies are neutralizing. And if you take away the mutations, all the neutralizing activity goes away. So this reaction um, happens in uh, special structures uh, that are in lymphoid organs called germinal centers. They have two zones, a dark zone and a light zone. And um, what my colleagues and I have done over the last several years is develop a model to try to explain how the selection process works in these germinal centers. So what we found, and this is the work of many labs, but uh, we have contributed very significantly to this, is that the dark zone, that first compartment, um, is where uh, the lymphocytes are undergoing the clonal expansion where they're dividing, but it's also where they're mutating. This structure is a dynamic structure. Cells move from one zone to the other, and it's an orchestrated set of movements. Once they finish dividing, they migrate up to the light zone. And the light zone where that pink stuff was in the previous slide is where the cells with new receptors that have been mutated test their receptors on the antigen. So they test whether or not they can still bind or whether the binding is better. And in fact, they compete for binding to the antigen. Cells that get the most antigen can present that to T follicular helper cells that live in that light zone. And then only the cells that have the best receptors are selected by the T cells on the basis of how much antigen they picked up. And they go back down and they divide again and they mutate again and they come up again and they go back down again and they repeat this cycle. Um, and you can imagine how that would rapidly lead to the selection of cells that have high affinity receptors. Now, 
There are two products of this reaction, and the two products of the reaction are memory B cells and plasma cells. And they're really um, very uh, different cell types. The plasma cell is producing uh, the antibodies that we're finding in our, in our plasma, the antibodies that are being used uh, in, in the coronavirus um, infection. And the memory cells is a, a reservoir, something to come back to. Now, um, people have studied uh, plasma cells quite a bit, and it's clear that they are selected from this environment, from the germinal center environment, based on their affinity. So high affinity B cells get transformed into plasma cells that produce high affinity antibodies. A, let, a lot less is known about the memory cell. Um, and it's been studied primarily by capturing it using antigens. Uh, so that requires that that cell have a certain affinity in order to be seen. And what I, I'm going to talk about in the next two or three slides is um, the work of Charlotte Viant, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, who decided to do this by lineage tracing to find out more about memory cells, not by their ability to bind antigen, but just by lineage tracing. And, and she did this by uh, labeling cells that are entering the germinal center, labeling them permanently so that once they are labeled, uh, they stay labeled and the products are labeled. And she did this um, with uh, a tamoxifen inducible uh, Cree. All right, so the question was, what is the affinity of the memory B cells if we take all comers and compare them to cells in germinal centers? So the way this experiment is done is there's an immunization with an HIV antigen. Um, Five days later, a tamoxifen injection. So that labels the cells that are entering germinal centers around day five, two or three days more. And now look in that germinal center or in memory cells 42 days later for antigen binding. And what you can see here is that it's easy to find cells that bind to the antigen in the germinal center that's expected. But in the memory compartment, there are very, very few cells that have sufficient affinity to be seen um, by the antigen. And that's true in multiple experiments uh, shown on, on the right. Now, this is true throughout the immune response. So you can see here if we label from day nine, if we label from day 15, if we label from day 21, it's always the same. There are cells in the germinal center that have high affinity, but they're rare in the memory compartment. All right, so does that mean that memory cells don't have any affinity for the antigen? No, that's, that's not the case. And so what we did to try to understand this was to clone the antibodies from cells labeled in this way, contemporaneous germinal center and memory B cells, cells that are born at the same time. And what we did was to look first at the ability of the antibodies, the FABs that were produced, monovalent antibodies, essentially monovalent reagents, um, to bind to the antigen on a chip. Um, and what you can see here is this is, is what the flow cytometry looks like. There are plenty of cells that have affinity in the germinal center, but hard to detect only one in this case out of 41 that have a demonstrable monovalent affinity for the antigen. All right, but the antigen in germinal centers is not monovalent. It's on those follicular dendritic cells, that pink stuff that I showed in an earlier slide. And those are probably polymers and immune complexes. So let's try with a uh, polyvalent uh, situation. And in order to do that, we put the fabs on the chip. So it's a polymer of fabs. Um, and then come with a trimeric uh, antigen. And now what you can see is that the memory cells have detectable affinity for the antigen. 
And a few more of the ones that we couldn't detect here in the germinal center also come up. Now we can further increase the so-called avidity um, of, of this assay by making a tetramer. That's what's familiar for uh, T cell people. You make a tetramer of the antigen. And now what you can see is even more of the memory cells uh, have some affinity. So the memory cells are coming into that compartment. They're coming into that compartment with actually very low levels of, uh, of affinity uh, for the antigen by and large. There are cells like this one here that have relatively higher affinity, but by and large, these cells are just variants uh, that have lower affinity for the antigen. So for plasma cells, the selection is clear. It's based on affinity. For memory cells, what you get is a whole collection of lymphocytes that have small variations in their receptors. And this may be a way for the immune system to look forward to variants of the pathogen. So the pathogen is going to evolve and the immune system is creating a way of dealing with that evolution. All right, so now I wanna just um, tell you a little bit about um, how we got to a coronavirus um, in, in just two or three slides. So what we started to work on was HIV because it was, a, it was and is a major uh, public health problem and very little understanding of why we don't really have a good vaccine. But it was known at the time that there were people uh, occasional individuals that would be able to create serologic activity antibodies that were able to neutralize the virus. And actually, if you were able to reproduce that, well, then you could create a vaccine. But these people were unusual and their immune response was unusual because it only developed after two or three years, not like that slide that I showed at the beginning where you get high affinity right away. Um, this is a process that took years to happen. So we were interested in finding out what are these people? What are they doing? How do they do it? And um, we started uh, these experiments, in fact, with a lot of help from the VRC, help us recruit these individuals. And what we did was to develop a technology, which is the same technology that has been used by just about everybody uh, cloning antibodies from humans uh, from that time on. Uh, and that is to select these people, take out their lymphocytes from the blood, and then incubate the lymphocytes with the antigen, with the protein target that you're interested in. So in the case of HIV, it's the HIV spike. Uh, in the case of the Zika virus, it's the Zika vi virus spike. Um, in the case of malaria, it's malaria antigens, and so on and so on. And using this technology, can sort out, can see the cell that actually binds it, that has a good receptor that binds the antigen, sort those as single cells, and then reproduce the antibodies by uh, molecular biology techniques. In HIV, uh, this has led to the finding of many very potent antibodies by our group and by others that adapted these techniques, including uh, the VRC that even improved on these techniques um, and these antibodies have now um, been advanced uh, into the clinic uh, for therapies and for prevention. In fact, we will soon hear about a very large trial sponsored by NIH um, using an antibody discovered by, by, by VRC for uh, HIV prevention. So, Essentially, we had been doing experiments looking at human antibody responses to viruses, starting with HIV. And so we were very prepared to do the same uh, when the coronavirus came up. And being in New York, um, we were hit early and hard uh, by this pandemic. And we were able to rapidly recruit um, individuals that had recovered from the disease to Rockefeller University Hospital, where we screened 2,000 people 
uh, and then eventually recruited 150 volunteers to come to the university to give blood uh, that we could then examine in a variety of ways, um, both the serum and the cells. And that's the work that I'm going to tell you about now. All right, so for the coronavirus, we knew a lot about it. And um, it was clear that this, the spike um, from this virus uh, interacts with uh, human cells through this receptor, uh, ACE2. And it's this interaction between the receptor binding domain that we were most interested in, because if antibodies could block this, they could block the infection. And if we could learn about those antibodies, we could learn something about how humans deal with this virus. And so what we did initially was to take those 150 sera and just look for the ability to bind to that region of the spike, the so-called receptor binding domain, the RBD. And you see that data here, these are ELISA graphs, and these are the areas under these curves. And what you can see here is that uh, these controls um, are people before corona, essentially. Um, and this is the group of 148. And, and there is reactivity, but it is not a huge amount of reactivity. So people that have recovered have made antibodies, but not tremendous numbers of antibodies uh, to this uh, RBD. The uh, binding of the uh, antibodies to the RBD is interesting, but more interesting is neutralization. And this was work uh, done in Paul B. Nash's lab that you heard about a little bit about last week, um, where he's produced a pseudovirus by uh, using a, um, an HIV backbone and inserting the spike into that backbone. So this pseudovirus has the corona spike on it. And it also has a nanoluciferase, which makes for a very good uh, assay for neutralization. So what we did together was to test uh, the sera first uh, for neutralizing activity. And this assay, the pseudovirus assay, is really quite a good assay and, and correlates very, very well with the neutralizing activity against the uh, actual SARS virus. That work was done in Charlie Rice's lab. So here are our plasmas, and you can see very strong correlations and monoclonal antibodies, and again, very, very strong correlations in these assays. This is what we found in the 148. So this just shows the top 60 of the 148. And what's remarkable here is that about half of these people of the top 60 have titers below one to 1,000. So not very high titers. And then the rest are below this with one third of them below one to 50. So really not a lot of neutralizing activity uh, in these individuals. The mechanism of neutralization uh, in this case is dependent on uh, bivalent antibody binding. So something akin to what I was showing uh, in the earlier slides. When you make a monovalent fab, um, that uh, fab, it takes a lot more of that to neutralize the virus than a bivalent antibody. And that's true for all of these different plasmas, all of these different IgGs. So cross-linking is important. And that has been confirmed in a whole series of different labs, as well as some of the other data that I just showed you, um, including a beautiful paper at Cell uh, from Peter Walter's lab using camelid antibodies. And the idea here is that uh, the spikes are close enough to get this kind of thing, this kind of cross-link, so that essentially if you're holding on with two hands and you let go with one, well, you're still there. But of course, if you were only holding on with one hand and let go, well, uh, Elmo might, might, might fall away. So what have we learned about the serology? Well, the levels of anti-RBD antibodies are, they're present, but they're not very high levels. Uh, they're low levels of neutralizing antibodies. Uh, they're present in, in, in nearly all infected individuals. Um, and cross-linking is, is, is an important mechanism here in neutralization. What about the clinic? What about the clinical 
uh, aspects uh, that, uh, that, that, that correlate with some of these things. Well, first of all, the neutralizing activity of plasma is directly correlated to anti-RBD binding. So if you want to select plasmas to give to people with high neutralizing activity, because that will be absolutely necessary in that case, you might be able to use RBD binding as a surrogate. People that are hospitalized generally had better titers than outpatients, and men had better titers than women. Just to put that into context and summarize it, the neutralizing activity, because these are all probably codependent variables, neutralizing activity correlates with the duration of the symptoms, the symptom severity, and the age. The longer you're infected, the more antigen you have, the better it is for your immune system in terms of being exposed to antigen and being able to produce antibodies. Men that are sicker than women fit right into that. And of course, hospitalized individuals as well. What I didn't show you is that IgA res responses, which are important um, in this mucosal infection, are higher in individuals with uh, GI symptoms. And they generally correlate with IgGs. Now, having um, samples from these uh, very generous individuals that came to donate, we were able to go ahead and examine the cells for the monoclonal antibodies that were being produced. And we did that exactly the way that I mentioned earlier, which is to take the cells from the blood and stain them with the antigen, with the SARS-CoV-2 spike RBD, and then use that to sort cells, single cells, and then use molecular biology to reproduce uh, those antibodies. And again, this was the bait, the RBD, uh, because we know that this is the interaction, that's the key interaction. And this is the, the kind of thing that we saw. So here are six individuals that we selected. They had variable levels of plasma reactivity. Controls, you can see, don't really stain. So we don't really see uh, cells uh, that bind to the RBD in the control. They must be there, but they are rare. And then in all of the individuals, we can find these cells. When we cloned them, we were able to obtain um, several hundred antibodies. The number of antibodies for each individual is in the center of the pie chart. The slices show expanded clones uh, and they're proportional to the size of the clone. And the colors indicate things that are shared between individuals, so different people making very, very similar antibodies. Um, and you can see that outlined here as well uh, in this circus plot. So expanded clones and shared antibodies. Some of these antibodies were very potent. And that's shown here in against the authentic SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and this, again, this was done in Charlie Rice's lab, uh, who's been a close collaborator on this project. And you can see that these antibodies are, na are nanogram, nanogram potency uh, or picomolar potency against uh, the virus. We also were interested not just in the IgGs, but in the IgAs, because again, this is a mucosal infection. And um, antibodies diversify themselves, not only at the variable regions, but also by class switch recombination to produce things like IgA. And IgA exists as a monomer in blood and as a polymer uh, in, uh, in the mucosa. So, um, what we found uh, for these individuals uh, is that at the same time that they were producing IgGs, they were also producing related IgAs, which is somewhat expected. And we did this for these three different individuals. And in every case, you can see related clones that are present as IgGs and IgAs. What was interesting about the IgAs is that when we tested the monomers versus the dimers, we got the same kind of result as we did with the fabs of the IgG and the intact IgG. That is that the dimers uh, were far more potent than the monomers. 
by an average of about 15 fold. And that may explain why some of these mucosally delivered vaccines are particularly effective uh, in the animal models. Uh, that is that they're eliciting reagents like these IgAs that are able to not just be present as a dimer, but as a multimer uh, to uh, cross-link uh, and neutralize the virus. Okay, so potent antibodies in many individuals, in all individuals, essentially. B cells producing the antibodies are rare in circulation. They initially have low levels of somatic mutation, nearly identical antibodies in different people, and some overrepresentation of a particular VH genes, and I'm going to come back to that when we go over mechanisms. IgM, IgGs, and IgAs with shared VDJs, and a higher potency for the IgA dimers uh, consistent with the cross-linking idea. All right, so now um, let's talk a little bit um, about uh, the mechanisms. The, um, the ACE, uh, the receptor, binds to the RBD when the RBD is in the up configuration. This thing here is a trimer. It has three RBDs, and they can flop up or down, but it's only when they're up that they're accessible to the ACE. So the antibodies that we cloned, many of which were very potent, um, have been studied structurally uh, to try to explain how they neutralize, why do we see overrepresentation of certain V genes and so on. And uh, Chris Barnes and Pamela Bjorkman's lab, we've been working with uh, very closely, has defined four different groups of antibodies. The first one shown here binds to the same surface as the RBD. And it only binds to the RBD when it's in the up configuration. Okay, so this class only binds up RBDs, very similar to ACE2. And the V genes are, that are in this group are overrepresented in part because the structures that interact with this surface the CDRH1, CDRH2 here are encoded in the genome. They're not part of CDRH3, which is formed during VDJ recombination. So unlike other antibodies, a great deal of the binding energy is coming from the genome encoded part of the antibody. And that may explain why these particular antibodies are overrepresented in this group. There's a second group um, that can bind the RBD in both up and down configurations. Uh, and there are some very interesting examples uh, in this group um, for mechanisms of neutralization. So the first group only neutralizes by blocking. This group does something else. It binds, yes, to the surface that interacts with the RBD. That's shown here. But in this trimer, there's a next door RBD. And this antibody actually has a footprint not only in the one RBD, but in both. In this one, it's not on the interaction surface. Whoops, sorry. What it's doing here is a long CDRH3 is reaching over into a hydrophobic pocket into the next door RBD. And when that happens, this thing locks down the RBD so that it is in a down configuration and it's blocked from binding ACE2 in two different ways. It's blocked because it's unavailable for ACE2, it's locked down, but also the ACE2 binding surface is occupied. So these lockdown uh, antibodies are in fact very, very potent. Um, and so far, there are only two examples of this kind of antibody. Uh, one of them is shown here, uh, C144. The other one was recently reported uh, by uh, Veer. A third category um, does not block the ACE binding directly, but interferes with it in some other way and binds to a complementary surface. Uh, so this uh, type of antibody, an example of which is this um, 
S309, uh, and another example of which is the antibody that, that we've cloned, C135. So it can bind both up and down RBDs, but it does not block ACE2 binding directly. It does it in some other way. So four classes. Um, one class represented by up only, a second class by up and down, including uh, blocking uh, the, the ACE interaction directly, and a third class, uh, which does it by a mechanism that we still don't understand completely, but can bind both up and down RBDs. So these should be complementary if you combine something like this, for example, with something like that which is exactly um, what, what we've done in, in, in some of the experiments I'm going to show you next. So high resolution structures of, of multiple different human uh, anti-RBD antibodies, group one binding to the open configuration, it's overrepresented uh, VH353, in part because the binding is mediated in, in, in a very significant manner by uh, CDRH1 and 2. Group one, group two can bind to both open and closed. And some of these enhance their parent affinity by using two hands artificially, essentially. Uh, one hand on one RBD and another hand on, on the other. Uh, and group uh, three, uh, which are just outside of the uh, interaction ridge. Now, if these antibodies are in fact complementary, um, they might prevent the emergence of uh, uh, antibody escape mutations, something that's a really big problem in HIV and may become a problem uh, in the coronavirus. And this is uh, some experiments that are done in Paul Benash's lab, essentially creating a virus, an RSV virus, that is a replicating virus, replication competent virus with the uh, SARS uh, spike, and then passaging it in the presence of antibody. Okay, so if you do that, in the presence of a single antibody, uh, this uh, 135 antibody. What you can see here is that in the control situation, all of the antibodies that we're testing, all three of them, the virus is sensitive. But now if you passage it with 135, it becomes 135 very resistant, but not to the other antibodies in this mix, the complementary antibodies. And if you do this with the two, antibodies. In fact, you do not see the emergence of resistance. So you can try pretty hard to passage the virus in the presence of the combination of antibodies, but you just do not see uh, emergence of resistance. This is true not just in this system, but it's also true for authentic SARS virus, which has a much more difficult time making mutations. So RSV, this one that was used, uh, has an easy time making mutations, SARS does not, but SARS mutations do arise and they do arise in the presence of, resistance arises in the presence of antibody in vitro. So human RBD antibodies can select for resistant variants in vitro. The resistance mutations bind directly to the antibody target sites. Uh, and we know this from the structures. Um, and combinations uh, can prevent the, the emergence of this resistance. All right, so now um, what about, what happens uh, to these antibodies? How, how do these antibodies behave in terms of prevention of infection or therapy? And this experiment um, was done in, in Dick Bowen's lab um, at Colorado State. Um, and this was, in fact, the experiment that I mentioned earlier that was um, very much participation from Gene Patterson and Kuei Dang uh, in helping to design this and um, eventually um, look at the data together. So what's done here is these animals, these hamsters are so-called the, the gold standard model, maybe, for this disease because they actually get sick. Um, and um, the, the infection that they get is, in fact, a very rapidly progressing infection. By day three is the peak of the infection uh, in, in the lungs. Uh, by day five, it's gone uh, in terms of the virus, but then they get uh, sick. They get uh, the pneumonitis. So two kinds of experiments. 
um, give the antibodies a day before infection or give the antibodies 12 hours after infection. So the window here is three days and we're giving it uh, at 12 hours. What do you get? All right, so first of all, this is a measure of plaque forming units. So it's not RNA, it's the real deal. We know that these are uh, infectious viruses that are present in the lungs of these animals at 10 to the sixth per 100 uh, milligrams of lung tissue. If you do this in the prevention mode, and these numbers here are the doses of antibodies that were delivered, uh, 20 milligrams per kilogram, six milligrams or two milligrams per kilogram, you can see that um, it's really uh, in three out of four of these animals, um, and, and the antibodies were delivered IP, so this person or this, this hamster um, uh, failed, but perhaps because the antibodies were injected into the gut and not into the perineal cavity. These four completely protected, these four uh, one uh, that isn't. So looks like very good uh, prevention at very low doses of antibodies. But more impressive for me is therapy. So here we gave uh, slightly higher doses uh, because we were worried that, you know, how is this going to work uh, in this very short period of time? Um, and what you can see here is that this was sterilizing. This dose was sterilizing. And even at this uh, very low dose, um, it, it has uh, very major effects in terms of uh, knocking the whole thing down by um, four or five uh, orders of magnitude. So very impressive results um, in, in this model. What about uh, macaques? Um, and again, uh, Gene and Quay were very deeply involved in, in planning these experiments and getting to be executed. Um, and these um, protection experiments uh, were done at Tulane uh, by um, uh, Chad Roy and his colleagues. Um, so here you give the antibody one day before infection to the monkeys. The monkeys are infected uh, intratracheally uh, intranasally and intraocularly. And this is what you see uh, in, in the nasopharynx. So here again, we used 20 milligrams per kilogram, six or two milligrams per kilogram, which are relatively modest doses um, and very good um, protection um, with all but uh, one of the animals in the two or two kilogram dose. A uh, couple of the animals there. So um, pretty impressive in the macaque model for protection. What about therapy? So therapy was done by uh, Cohen von Rampe and his colleagues at Davis. And what we're looking at here is um, the uh, tissue, uh, the lung tissue in these animals. And this experiment was done by giving the animals the antibody one day uh, after infection. Again, the peak is very early on uh, in this model, um, between days three and four, something like that. Um, and the assays were performed after seven days. And so what uh, was done here was to look at lung sections by two pathologists who did this blinded. Uh, and then they graded the lungs based on what they saw so grade zero, the alveoli look normal, and then varying degrees of thickening uh, that indicate pneumonitis. And this is what they found, which is that um, there was a very significant difference between the animals that were treated and the animals that were untreated. So in both therapy models, uh, the antibodies delivered early are having a very significant effect on um, the lung. All right, so I wanna just uh, summarize um, and, and, and uh, go over a little bit about what, what we've been able to do. We've, uh, we recruited um, 148 individuals uh, and have studied their immune responses uh, to this uh, virus. Um, in doing so, we were able to um, uh, find um, 
a lot of interesting things actually about how humans respond to this virus, including the fact that there are clonally expanded groups of lymphocytes that are producing high affinity antibodies that are neutralizing and that many humans do very similar things in terms of how they neutralize the virus. We've been able to uh, use these antibodies um, to define uh, different classes of neutralizers and complementary sites on the virus um, that are targeted by these antibodies. Uh, and we've also been able to show that these things could have a role uh, in, in this pandemic, uh, both for uh, protection um, in people that, for example, don't respond uh, to vaccines, um, people like me that are old enough to have a problem with uh, vaccine responses, uh, and also uh, in therapy for people who have not received the vaccine or who have received the vaccine and still get infected. Uh, antibodies are being developed by a whole group, a series of different companies um, with uh, a lot of help from uh, Operation Warp Speed um, uh, and, and the NIH. And this is just a list. And the two that are furthest along uh, on this list are Regeneron and Lilly. They may not have the best antibodies, um, but others um, will come along. And um, I'm very optimistic that these reagents uh, will be available uh, in, in the near future um, for help with both um, prevention and therapy. With that, I just um, want to say again that this um, that what I've talked about is, is, is an effort um, by many labs. Um, we, you know, we did the, the antibody cloning part and we worked with Charlie and uh, with Paul on uh, the neutralization assays. But um, uh, Pamela Bjorkman, for example, uh, her lab, and in particular, Christopher Barnes, a postdoc in her lab, did uh, all of the structural work uh, with a lot of help from others there, uh, but led that, that effort. And the clinical colleagues here were absolutely essential, Marina Kasky's group, in, in getting us started because the hardest part, it seems to me that one of the hardest parts of this whole thing is of the clinical aspect, um, getting people here, getting clinical protocols uh, and, and, and convincing people that it's a good thing to do. Um, and finally, at Davis uh, and at Tulane uh, for uh, the monkey studies and uh, the Bowen lab um, at, in Colorado uh, for all the work on, on, on the hamsters. And I haven't had time to talk about mice, but we've done the same thing in mice uh, with uh, Ralph Barish's lab. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions if there are any. We're all applauding. Michelle, thank you for a really wonderful, brilliant presentation, uh, working through some of the details of the immune system and its ability to generate this kind of very specific biomolecules. I've often said in congressional hearings, you have a biotechnology factory inside your body and it's a very efficient one. And it also keeps a record uh, of what it has done in the past and it can pull those things out of the file if it needs to which is kind of how vaccines are supposed to protect us all. Um, if you'll permit me, I'm gonna ask the first question, but if people have other questions they wanna pose, just to remind you on your videocast website, if you see the word send live feedback uh, at the bottom of the webpage you're watching, uh, you can use that to send in a question, which then I will try in some way uh, to put forward uh, to Michelle. But Michelle, you uh, at the end there, we're talking uh, about the potential here uh, of uh, these neutralizing monoclonal antibodies in the uh, primate model uh, to be pretty darn effective in terms of both prevention and treatment. We know that in the human trials uh, the, that we've heard a bit about, although none of this is really published, it's mostly press releases, uh, that it does look as if individuals who are treated fairly early after they develop symptoms uh, do in fact have a lower likelihood, this is the Lilly antibody, of requiring hospitalization. We don't yet know whether that results in long-term survival benefits, but it's the hospitalization numbers look pretty interesting. And of course, everybody's wondering, what's the window 
of opportunity for therapeutics. It kind of makes sense that this would work best if you start early, but how long will that window extend if you have somebody who's already in the hospital or worse yet, somebody in the ICU who's really sick? Are monoclonal antibodies gonna work in that later stage or is that a little too late for this to work? Francis, I think those people get the least benefit from this um, because their disease is really not driven by viral replication. Their disease is driven by the damage that the virus has already done. Um, so they are going to get the least benefit. That's not to say that there may not be some benefit from that, but it's, it's, it's going to be the least. The people that are gonna benefit most from this um, are, for example, the contacts, right? So if someone in your immediate vicinity is infected and known to be infected, uh, then all of the contacts would benefit from some, an intervention like this. Um, and then going on from there, people who are diagnosed early who do not have symptoms um, or have mild symptoms would also potentially uh, benefit. And the further down you go and the more damage the virus does and the less virus there is in the system, the less likely any intervention like this um, will, will, will be a benefit. Presumably it also has something to do whether your own immune system has had a chance to mount its defenses against the virus. I, I think Regeneron in their press release seemed to indicate that the people who benefited were the ones that were zero negative at the time they got the antibody. Those who were already zero positive didn't seem to get a whole lot of benefit. Yeah, and those would be people later on also because the adaptive system takes at least a week or two to get to antibodies. So if you have antibodies, you've been infected for a while already. Mm -hmm. um, so this is entirely consistent with the early therapy idea. Well, let me give you some of the questions that are coming in, starting with the basic science question because you gave us some nice uh, basic science about memory B cells. So this is from Bimal Chakrabarty. Uh, do you mean that in general, the affinity of memory B cells to antigen is less than plasma B cells? Is it true that high affinity memory B cells are deleted? No, no. Um, what I showed there and what I, I wanna convey is that there are high affinity B cells in the memory compartment. It's obvious that there are because here I've just shown you that we've cloned them from that compartment. But that compartment as a general compartment, uh, those cells are, are small numbers, right? And most of that compartment is devoted to variants, to creating an additional level of immunologic diversity. Um, and perhaps looking forward to a mutant pathogen. Got it. Um, you talked about the possibility that mutation um, creates the possibility of escape. So question from uh, Perez Diaz, should viral, could viral escape mutants lead to the reappearance of the disease that occurs at about day 10? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, you know, I simply don't know the answer to that. And I don't know that that's been studied. It would be a very interesting uh, sort of study to do to follow the virus in people that are sick for a long time and that are viremic for a long time to see if it's actually evolving in those individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, presumably if you treated somebody with the monoclonal and you selected for a virus uh, strain that no longer would respond to the monoclonal, you'd still have that person's own immune system <laughs> kind of ready yes. to take on the challenge, but um, you'd wanna see what happens. Yes. Yes, and it'll be very interesting to look at, um, you know, what happens in this Lilly trial in particular, because Lilly is going with a single antibody uh, to see if they are selecting for variants in the people that are being treated. Uh, my guess is that they eventually will find such variants. Yeah, I've actually seen a little bit of their data, uh, which just got kind of put forward in the last few days, and it does look with the monotherapy, uh, there is the possibility of a strain uh, emerging, which is already there. It's not that it happened as a mutation in the course of their infection, but this, this virus already has some heterogeneity in its genome sequences. 
Yes. And uh, that, that not terribly common, maybe um, less than 1% strain gets selected for. But in their experience with the monoclonal uh, monotherapy, uh, the immune system kicked in and wiped it out anyway. Uh, but you'd like to be sure that always happens. Yeah, you, you want to, especially because you're going to give, you know, some of the populations that will require this form of therapy will be, for example, cancer patients where their immune systems yeah. are wiped out. Uh, and that will not be a possibility for those people. So it, in general, you know, in, in HIV, people learned this lesson uh, early on that monotherapies just weren't sufficient uh, for vi this kind of viral pathogen. And here, uh, it just will be safer uh, to have combinations like the Regeneron combination and like the combination that we've been studying. So Michelle, the uh, message, the questions are piling up and unfortunately we're just about at the end of the hour. Maybe I'll just ask you one more somewhat randomly chosen. Uh, maybe this one triggered a bit by uh, the very public uh, information we have about the treatment of the president. Would you expect treatment with steroids to affect the quality of an antibody response uh, that is, are, is providing steroids? I think we're not talking here about a situation where monoclonals are being delivered as a therapeutic, although that happened also in the case of the president. But what, what do steroids do in general uh, to the antibody response to somebody who's gotten infected with COVID? Should we be passing them around uh, willy-nilly? No. Yes. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. The recommendation is, I mean, it's not, I don't really, you know, I don't know enough details about, you know, what, um, what happened in, in this particular case. But the recommendation is that the steroid should be given to people that are really very seriously ill um, and not earlier on because, in fact, they might interfere uh, in some way or other with immunity. So, um, you know, uh, it's hard to guess what physicians were thinking. Uh, we won't go there <laughs> since we are not, as they say, we're not in the room where it happened. Yes. Uh, finally, just because several people are asking about this, does any of what you have learned so far help us with this question of how long immunity might be sustained? Because we're all really thinking about that in terms of natural infection, but also in terms of vaccines. Is this going to be a virus uh, that is going to keep vexing us every once in a while, maybe more often than we'd like, because immunity is not lasting as long as we wish it would? Yeah, I, I think we should take our lessons there from the other coronaviruses. It's very likely that our, we will have immunity in a sense that we will have these memory cells that are present and able to respond rapidly. What that means is our, our serum levels of antibodies may be too low to protect us in some cases, and others may protect. But even if the serum levels are low and you get infected with this coronavirus, it may be that your immune system can respond rapidly enough that your infection will not be a serious infection. So if you've been through it once, the chances are that you'll do fine the second time as well. Um, that's pretty much what happens with the other coronaviruses. Right, and I guess we have that case of a gentleman from Hong Kong who did get infected a second time with what's clearly a different virus because it was genomic, uh, very different and had no symptoms at all. Now that's N equals one, we all know yeah. how dangerous that is. Michelle, this has been a wonderful lecture and a Thank wonderful you. way to honor Bill Paul and uh, the presentation you gave and the discussion we just had uh, was just what I was hoping for here, now bringing together immunology and our current COVID crisis and trying to figure out how we could bring those scientific tools to the forefront uh, to get us through this. And we are gonna get through this, even though yeah. we're not quite there yet. Yes, uh, it's a great honor, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be able to do, very honored to be able to do this. Thank well, you. Please join me, everybody, in thanking our Bill Paul lecturer for 2020, and have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. Bye. Bye for now.